Hi and welcome back. Now that we have an introduction as to what exactly is cloud computing, our next step is to understand what is Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services is a separate entity that's part of its parent company Amazon. Using Amazon Web Services, you can build, test and deploy your applications. There are a whole number and list of services which you can use in Amazon Web Services and every year this list of services grows and for each service even its integral features keeps on changing they keep on improving so what Amazon does is that they look at feedback from customers who are using these services they then take this feedback and make their services even better so what I said can you do with Amazon Web Services if you look at an application such as Facebook right so Facebook is a company that gives you this application so that you could interact with other people let's say that you want to build and deploy an application similar to Facebook you could do that using Amazon Web Services so you could use these services in Amazon to not help you build your application but also help you deploy your application so I said my own site, which I showed you in the last video, is hosted using Amazon Web Services. Now, in order to start using Amazon Web Services, you need to create something known as an account. We have a separate chapter on how you can create an account with Amazon Web Services. So we are going to look at that as well. But this was just to give you a brief on what is Amazon Web Services. So this is, I said, a list of services available to you on the internet. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now, before we move forward, I just want to talk about a very important point. This is based on my experience working and teaching students on cloud computing platforms. And that's basically your knowledge or basic knowledge on IT. Now, I mentioned in the last chapter that cloud computing platforms such as Amazon Web Services makes things such as development and deployment of your applications much easier. But that means you should at least have that knowledge of what it takes to build and deploy an application. So, for example, you should at least have some basic knowledge of what is a server and at least worked on one of the types of servers such as Linux or Windows. You should have a general understanding on how systems work. You should know what are databases. You should have probably worked with at least one database such as Oracle, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server and have some networking knowledge. Now, I said this is from a very broad aspect. If you look at the services on a cloud computing platform, they span a lot of domains, technical IT domains. These are just a few I'm listing down. If you want to start working on cloud computing platforms, I said you should have some basic knowledge on all of these core aspects. Because what these cloud computing platforms do is that they just make working with these systems much more easier and simpler and cost effective. So for that, we still need to know the basics. I've seen students who are like fresh off the boat, who don't have any knowledge on how IT systems work. They find it very difficult to catch on on cloud computing. So this entire idea was just to make you understand, you know, set your expectations right. So students who want to learn about cloud computing, I recommend that if you don't have any knowledge on IT, that you do some groundwork, some back work on how these normal services work and then start learning about cloud computing. Right, so this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, let's talk about AWS regions and availability zones. And this is really important as you move through your journey on the AWS cloud. So if you are planning on 
proceeding from becoming a cloud practitioner to going on to the AWS associate level, the professional level, or even the specialist exam, this basic understanding of AWS regions and availability zones is very, very important. Now, I've just put this map on the global infrastructure of AWS. So this is the reference link. Now, this map shows you the different locations or the points of presence for Amazon Web Services. So in these different locations, AWS has set up their data centers. These data centers have these physical underlying hardwares that allow you to host services or resources on the AWS cloud. Now the ones which are marked in yellow and have numbers, we'll actually go through that numbers a little bit later on, are the ones which are already in place. As you know, AWS keeps on growing and the ones marked in green are the new and upcoming regions in which AWS is developing their presence. So let's take a fraction of that map. So each of these circles represent regions. For example, in this map, we have the Oregon, the North California, and the AWS Government Cloud region. So each region consists of data centers. There could be one or there could be multiple data centers. So these are actual physical locations which have physical buildings and these buildings contain the hardware which AWS uses, I said, in order for us as the customer to host our resources on the AWS cloud. So why is AWS investing in creating these data centers around the world? I mean, what could influence your choice on which region you would choose to host AWS resources? Well, the main important thing to consider is your application. So let's say you are building an application, you want to host it on the AWS cloud. Where are your customers located? Are they located in some particular part of the world, in some particular region? Would you want them to get the best user experience when accessing your application? These are all very important factors. So let's go back to our map. So let's say you have your application. Let's say it's hosted in one of the regions, you know, let's say the Oregon region. Let's say your users are situated at the other end of the world, let's say in the Asia region. Imagine the latency or the amount of time it would take for the request and the response to travel across the world from your application to your end users. Wouldn't it be more beneficial if you actually host the app more closest to your users? And that's why AWS has a presence which they have developed across the world in different geographic locations known as regions. Now let's quickly go through the concept of what these numbers mean. So you have these numbers of three, three and three. Well, these are known as availability zones. Now each region compromises of multiple availability zones. Now in the first picture, I said that regions have these multiple data centers or physical buildings. Now these, now let's take an example that you have four data centers or four physical buildings. Now they will all not be located together. You know, what AWS does is that it splits these data centers into different logical units known as availability zones. 
So when you're hosting your application, what AWS will do is that it will actually port your application onto one of these data centers or you yourself can do that. You can say that I want my application to be in one availability zone and under the covers, AWS will ensure that that application is hosted on the physical data center that is mapped to that availability zone. Now, as we go through this course on the AWS Cloud Practitioner, you will actually get a better understanding on regions and availability zones. You have to drill this concept in your mind as you keep on going through your journey on the AWS Cloud. But for now, just understand these key concepts that you have regions across the world and regions have something known as availability zones. And one of the major advantages of why you would have availability zones is that if any data center were to go down, so it could be a power outage, the data center is not available. You can actually quickly switch over your app to another availability zone, which would ensure that your application now runs off another data center. And this ensures the working of your application. This is one of the core reasons as to why AWS has split regions into availability zones. So now that we've kind of understood the basic concepts of regions and availability zones, let's mark an end to this chapter and let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back to this course on the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner. In this chapter, we're going to go through the free tier account. So here I've just opened the documentation for the free tier which is available from AWS. Now in order to practice, in order to work with AWS resources, you need to create an account first. Now there are different types of accounts that's available, but normally if you're just fresh to AWS, if you're fresh to cloud computing, AWS gives you this ability to create something known as a free account. So in the free account, you get 12 months free worth of a certain number of services. After 12 months, you start getting charged for the usage of those services. Now, please also note that there are only certain number of services which are free. But let me tell you that this is quite good when you want to start using cloud computing resources. Let's take an example of EC2. So this is your virtual server on the cloud you get 750 hours of running EC2 capacity. Let's go on and expand the details. Now in the details, please note that it says it's 750 hours per month of t2.micro instance. So this is an instance type. Anything that is different from this instance type. So let's say you choose a different instance type, you will be charged. So remember that this is only applicable to a T2 dot micro instance type. You will actually understand this when we actually create our first EC2 instance. There it actually clearly shows you what is part of the free tier and what is not part of the free tier. So even though they give you free usage of a particular service, it's not sometimes across the board. So always be wary of that. Now what happens if you use another instance type well you will be charged so when you create the free account you still need to specify a credit card so this is because that if you by chance exceed the usage of a particular service you will still be charged so i didn't mention that this free account is free for a certain number of services for a certain extent. So it's not completely across the board. That is why you need to specify a credit card when you create a free tier account. Please make note of this. You can actually go through this entire page. I believe this has a resource to this chapter. You can see what are the different services which are provided to you free of cost. If you look at the simple storage service, you get 5 GB of standard storage, which is pretty good. So the lot of services which are good to start when using 
AWS. So my recommendation is that if you want to practice using AWS, start creating the free account that marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to go through the virtual private cloud. Again, for those administrators who are familiar with this picture, I know that it's great to actually do this activity of maintaining the networks for your organization, but at times it can be tricky. So networking is an important aspect in any organization. It's so important because it connects all the systems together. But sometimes this can become a maintenance overhead for a company it could be difficult. I mean, they would not want to invest the amount of time and resources to take care of these networks. So in AWS, you have the virtual private cloud. This is your own isolated network on Amazon Web Services on the internet. Here, you don't need to worry about the networking, the cables, nothing. Everything is done for you by AWS. You can create the network. You can define something known as subnets. You can create your servers in this network. You can also define security. So if you want to decide what is the traffic, who is allowed to enter your network, you can do this via the security measures which are available for the virtual private cloud. And I said, you don't need to bother about the stuff such as cabling. So you don't need to buy the cables, maintain the network, maintain the racks, nothing. All done by Amazon Web Services. Now, in the next chapter, we are going to go through another service, which is known as Elastic Compute Cloud. That's the virtual server service. And then I'm going to take you to the Amazon Web Services console. I'm just going to show you the virtual private cloud and how we're going to create our first EC2 or virtual server on the cloud. Hi and welcome to this chapter on the Elastic Compute Cloud service. So again, I've broadened the picture which we had in the last chapter in the virtual private cloud. So a large organizations have these data centers in which you have your racks and racks of physical servers. All of these servers are used to maintain something known as workload. So what do you want to, you know, uh, what are the applications you want to maintain on the servers? What are the applications that your company are exposing to users? So if you were a large company, you would have these racks and racks of servers. You would have people involved to take care of these servers. You had to maintain different aspects such as the power supply, uh, the cooling, a lot of aspects to take care of when you maintain your own servers in your own data center. So what is the Elastic Compute Cloud service? In AWS, this is a service that is used to launch and manage virtual servers on the internet. Here, you don't need to manage a lot of aspects. Firstly, you don't need to manage that entire data center which we saw in the previous picture. The networking, the cooling, the physical hardware, the physical security, all of this is done by Amazon Web Services. They take extra special security and care to maintain those physical servers. All you need to do is create virtual servers in their data centers. So what you would do, you would go on to something known as the Amazon Web Services console. This is what the picture looks like. And you would use that to spin up your virtual servers. For you, it's like virtually available on the internet. I said, you don't need to worry about those underlying physical servers or those racks, networking, etc. In AWS, this virtual server is known as an Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2 instance. You can create these virtual servers on demand. Now, what's the best thing about on demand? So what's the benefit of an on demand? Now, if I just go back to our big data center picture, 
Now imagine for a company, you want to host a server so that you could you know, host an application for exposing to your users. So let's say if you're a big corporation like Facebook, you want to expose that application. You first need to install that application on a large number of physical servers. Now by looking at this picture, what all do you need to invest in? What do you need to pay for? Well, you need to obviously pay for the racks, for the servers, for the network cabling, for the lights, for the cooling, for the entire building, and even for the people who are required to take care of this entire infrastructure. That's a lot of investment. So let's come back. So the best thing about on demand is that you only pay for the server itself, nothing else. You don't pay for the racks, the building, the personnel, nothing. You just pay for the server and you only pay for the server when you start the server. You don't pay anything upfront. There is nothing of a capital investment that you need to make. You can also terminate the server whenever you want. Imagine that you bought a physical server. You just can't terminate it. You don't you lose the money, right? You invested that money on that physical server. You, If you don't require it anymore, you've lost that investment. That money is lost. In AWS, you only pay for how much ever you use. So if you've created a virtual server on the cloud, you only pay for the time it's running. So now we are going to go to the Amazon Web Services console. I'm just going to show you briefly how you can create a virtual server on the cloud. So here we are in the Amazon Web Services console. Now, in order to create your first virtual server, you have to go to the compute section and click on EC2. Now, when you launch an EC2 instance or a virtual server, there are a lot of aspects that you need to specify. Now, all of these aspects you will learn when you go into more detailed courses on Amazon Web Services. So in order to create or launch your first instance, you can click on launch instance. Now the first screen you are presented with, you have to decide what will be the underlying operating system for your particular virtual server. You can choose from a wide variety available in Amazon. For now, I'm just going to choose Windows Server. Next, you should choose what should be the underlying capacity. How many CPUs do you want? How much memory do you want? So I'll choose one as per my specification. I'll go on to next. Now over here, you need to specify the network in which you want to launch your server in. We're not going into much detail. Let's leave everything as it is. Next, you can add storage for that server. I'll leave the storage as it is. You can add a tag for the server, so you can give a name for the server. So you can say, this is my demo server. Next, we need to specify a security group. I'll just create a new one. And I'll click on review and launch. I'll click on launch. Now over here, we need to create a new key pair. Now a key pair is basically used to do a secure login. So if you want to log into your server, you have to specify the name of a key pair. You can give any name that you want. So I'm giving a name of demo key pair. Please ensure that you download the key pair because this is required when you want to log into the instance. I'm going to say now launch the instance. And then on the next screen, I can say view the instances. Right, so this is our dashboard. We now have a virtual server which is being spun up on the cloud. This will just take a couple of minutes. Let's come back once this is done. Now, once your virtual server is in the running state, we can click on the connect button. Now, it's saying that we need to get a password. So let's click on get password. Now, here we have to choose that file which we created when we launched our instance. So I'm just going to go and browse for that file. So currently I've just stored it on my D drive, the demo key pair. I'll click open. I'll say decrypt the password. 
and here you can see the password has been automatically generated for you it's not a simple one and we are going to use this to log into our server now let's click on download remote desktop let's click on the desktop icon let's click on connect and let's put in the password click on ok click on yes And now you will see that from my laptop, I am now connected to a server on the cloud. I didn't need to buy a physical server, install anything, nothing. It just took me a couple of minutes to have a brand new server on the AWS cloud. And you can use this like any other server. You can install whatever you want, use it as you desire. So this is a key benefit of the AWS cloud when it comes to virtual servers. And virtual server is one of the core services which is used in AWS. When you learn more about AWS in various certification courses, you will have a deep dive into virtual private cloud and into how to work with these virtual servers in your cloud network. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now I just want to talk briefly about another service on AWS, which is known as the Simple Storage Service. So this is storage for the cloud. No longer do you need to require or depend upon disks, USB, SD cards for your data. So no need to carry them around with you. It's all available on the internet. So there are different storage options on the internet for uploading your files. In AWS, this storage service is known as the simple storage service. So this is storage for the cloud. What's good about the service is that you don't need to specify how much you want. So imagine you have a USB stick or you have a hard disk. You are limited by the amount of storage that's available on that device. But in the simple storage service, you can upload virtually how much ever data you want. That's because this service automatically grows the storage in the background. You don't need to worry about adding storage yourself. You just upload whatever you want to upload and you can access that data from anywhere. It's highly durable. You don't have to worry about going down, losing your files. You can be safely assured that your files will be in place after you upload them. And all of these files, as I mentioned, can be accessed via a public URL. So with a URL, you can download the file onto any location. So now let's go over to Amazon Web Services and let's look at a brief demo on how we can use the simple storage service. Hi and welcome back. So now I just want to talk briefly about another service on AWS, which is known as the simple storage service. So this is storage for the cloud. No longer do you need to require or depend upon this. USB SD cards for your data. So no need to carry them around with you. It's all available on the internet. So there are different storage options on the internet for uploading your files. In AWS, this storage service is known as the simple storage service. So this is storage for the cloud. What's good about the service is that you don't need to specify how much you want. So imagine you have a USB stick or you have a hard disk. You are limited by the amount of storage that's available on that device. But in the simple storage service, you can upload virtually how much ever data you want. That's because this service automatically grows the storage in the background. You don't need to worry about adding storage yourself. You just upload whatever you want to upload 
and you can access that data from anywhere. It's highly durable. You don't have to worry about going down, losing your files. You can be safely assured that your files will be in place after you upload them. And all of these files, as I mentioned, can be accessed via a public URL. So with a URL, you can download the file onto any location. So now let's go over to Amazon Web Services and let's look at a brief demo on how we can use the simple storage service. Now once you've logged into Amazon Web Services, in order to access the simple storage service, go on to storage and go on to S3. Now before you can actually start uploading files onto the service, you have to create something known as a bucket. A bucket is nothing but a container for your objects. When you click on create bucket, you have to give a bucket name. Now the thing about this bucket name is that it needs to be unique across all of AWS. So if you have another user who's already created a bucket with the same name, you will not be able to utilize that name for your bucket. So you have to ensure that it's unique. Now one way of knowing this is when you create the bucket itself, if the name has already been taken, so let me just click on create, it will give you an error. It will say that the bucket name already exists. So we have to make sure that it's a unique bucket name. I'm going to click on create bucket. So no one has gone ahead and created a bucket known as demo bucket 345. Now, as part of my learning, as part of my teaching, I already have a number of buckets in the simple storage service. Let's go on to the bucket which we have created. In this, we can go ahead and we can up start uploading files. We can also create folders if we want. Now, I'm going to upload a simple sample.txt file onto this bucket. So when you click on upload, you can then add a file. So I have a file in my D drive. So I'm going to choose that sample.txt file and I'm going to click on upload. So once you've uploaded the file, you've got the file in place. If you click on the file, you get something known as a link. So now you can actually access or download the file via this link. Now, in order to allow public access, so you want to download this file from anywhere, you have to click on this make public icon. Once that is done, if I now open this in a new tab, I will see the contents of the file. So that file had nothing but hello world. So this was a very simple demonstration of the simple storage service. Obviously, like all other AEW services, there is a lot more that goes into the simple storage service. And as you go further on in your journey on the AWS cloud, you will learn more about it. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in the next few chapters, I want to give you a feel of what you can do on the AWS platform. So we've already seen in earlier chapters how we could create our own virtual server on the cloud. We've seen how to use the simple storage service. Now, just to move on ahead, I'm just going to show you some things that you can do using the services in AWS. So the first thing I'm going to show is how you can host your own static website using the simple storage service. Now for the purpose of this example, I have a simple demo.html file. This is just a sample file which I have on my local hard disk. Now let's say you have a full fledged website. It's a static website. So by static, I mean that it's not dynamic in nature. It does not change. It does not render HTML pages on the fly to the users. It's just made up of static HTML pages. You can have JavaScript. You can have bootstrap script, but in the end, it's a static website. Now, if you had to host a static website, 
there is a lot of headache in hosting a website but you can do this very easily using the simple storage service so here I am in the S3 management console so in an earlier chapter we had seen how we could create a bucket in S3 we had seen how we could upload objects onto a bucket in S3 and we saw how we could access the object in that bucket via something known as a public URL. I want to show another feature in the simple storage service known as static website hosting. Now for this I'm going to create a brand new bucket. Now if you want to map your own domain name to your website in Amazon you have to ensure that the name of the bucket is the same as your domain name. Now, for example, there is another service known as Route 53 in Amazon in AWS. So if you go on to the main AWS dashboard and if you search for Route 53, you can see it has a scalable DNS and domain name registration service. So over here, if you want, you can go ahead and buy a domain name, but I've already bought a domain name from a third party provider. So that domain name is known as cloudhublearning.com. So I've gone ahead and bought this domain on the internet. Now I've also registered this as something known as a hosted zone in route 53. Again, when I'm going, I said into details about all of these services. You will learn all about this when you actually go for certification courses. Since this is just an introduction to cloud computing, I want to show you what you can do on a cloud computing platform. Right, so let's come back. So I have my domain name cloudhublearning.com. Now in this, I now need to ensure that the name of my bucket is also the same. So it should be cloudhublearning.com. So now I'm going to go ahead, click on create bucket and I'm going to enter the full DNS name of cloudhublearning.com. I'll go ahead and create the bucket. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go ahead and upload that HTML file, which I have on my D drive. So it's my demo.html file. I'll click on upload. If I just go on to the file, I'll just mark it public. Let me open it up in a new tab. Right, so I've got my demo.html file, but currently it has, uh, you know, a big DNS name in its path. I want to reduce this and I want to enable it as a static website, an entire static website. So let's go ahead to the S3 management console. Let's go on to our bucket. If you go on to properties, there is a special property known as static website hosting. If you click on this and then click on use this bucket to host a website, then you need to put the name of the document, which will be the index document. So when you go on to this endpoint, automatically this document will be shown. So I'm going to make this as our demo.html page, which we have uploaded to our bucket. I am just going to go ahead and copy this endpoint. Let me click on save. So we've enabled static website hosting. If I go on to the other tab, let me just paste the URL. And now you can see you're getting your sample web page. So we've done a couple of things over here. We now have a static website enabled in our S3 bucket. Now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go on to my Route 53 domain name service. Now what you can do in Route 53 for your domain name, you can actually now point your domain name to the S3 website endpoint. So once you choose this and you click on save record set. Now let's just wait for a couple of minutes and come back. Now after a couple of minutes when you come back, now when you go on to cloudhublearning.com, you now get your sample page. So what's happening over here is that now when you go on to your domain name, it's going on to the Route 53 service and from the Route 53 service, it's going to a static website which is hosted in our S3 bucket. 
So this is the simplest way in which you can host a static website without the need of you spinning up a virtual server, hosting a web server, hosting your application, paying for that. A very simple cost effective solution if you just want to host a static website. Right, so this marks the end of this use case scenario. Hi and welcome back. Now in an earlier chapter, we had seen how we could actually create a virtual server on the cloud and we had created a Windows based virtual server. Now as part of the use case scenario, let's do a little bit or a little something more interesting. I want to have a server which has an application installed on it. So what you can do is that you could spin up your own virtual server, log into the server, install the application that you require. But I want to show you a cool feature or a cool place in which you get these pre-baked AMIs or Amazon machine images which already have applications already installed on them. Let me give you an example by going through this use case scenario. So I'm going to go on to our compute EC2 section and what I'm going to do over here is that I'm going to launch an instance. So earlier on I said that we had actually gone through this first page where we chose our Windows Server image or the AMI. Well we also have something known as the AWS Marketplace. So in the marketplace, you have a lot of Amazon machine images, which already have applications installed on them. So you have various companies which actually build their own Amazon machine images and they publish it on this Amazon marketplace. So if I go ahead and let's search for WordPress. So WordPress is a very famous solution for hosting content. So you can see that you already have some AMIs which have WordPress already installed on them. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's have a look. Let's select the first one. So what this will do is that it will install or it will have Ubuntu as the base operating system. And then on this, it will automatically have WordPress installed. So let me click on select. So here it will just give you some information mainly on what is the product details and obviously on what is the cost. Now sometimes the application itself will have a cost but when it comes to WordPress it doesn't have a cost associated with the application. It just has obviously a cost for the underlying EC2 instance. So if you look at the software cost it's zero. But in some cases, when you choose an application from another vendor, it could have a cost also associated with it. So you have to be very careful. But I said for WordPress, there is no cost for the software. There's only a cost for the virtual server. So I'm going to click on continue. Again, we have to go through the same steps as we have seen in the earlier chapter when we created our EC2 instance. So I'm going to choose this as a t2.micro. This should be sufficient enough. I will leave the instance details as it is. I will leave the storage as it is. In the tag, I will add it as a name value pair. So I'll give it a key of name and the value of WordPress. Now in the security group, it's automatically created a security group for us. So I'm going to accept that default security group. It will allow us to actually reach the website. I click on review and launch. Click on launch. Acknowledge that I have the key pair and then launch the instance. So let's go to view instances and let's come back. Let's give this a couple of minutes and then come back once the instance is in the running state. Now after a couple of minutes, once your instance is up and running, if you take the public IP or even the public DNS name of this server and if you go on to another tab, you will now see that you have your own 
WordPress site set up for you. So automatically WordPress is installed on the server for you. How easy was that? You spun up a virtual server which had WordPress installed so you don't have to go ahead and install it. Note that you can still log into the server and you can make changes to the installation as required. But for those who want to get started quickly, this is the best solution. Now remember in the earlier chapter, we had seen how we could use the Route 53 service to point a domain name to a static website in our S3 bucket. Well, we can do the same thing. So let's go on to cloudhublearning.com and we can actually point this to our virtual server which has WordPress installed. So if you go on to cloudhublearning.com, again, don't worry about the technical details on how this is done. But what we need to do is that we need to go and take the public IP, go back to raw 53 enter the value here, save the record set. And once this is done, let's wait for a couple of minutes and come back. So after a minute, when you come back, if you go on to cloudhublearning.com, that's your domain name, you now go on to your WordPress site. As simple as that. So here we've seen another powerful feature or advantage of using cloud computing on AWS. This marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I want to talk about the relational database service or the RDS service. Before we actually jump into the relational database service, I want to give you a simple scenario. Let's say you want to host an Oracle database. So if you want to do this on, let's say AWS, what would be the general list of steps? So you probably spin up an EC2 instance, you would attach some EBS volumes, you would then install the Oracle software, you would download and install the Oracle software, you would do the required configuration, you would ensure all the log files, data files, everything is in place. Uh, and then you would start using that Oracle software. Now, in AWS, they have something known as the relational database software, which can alleviate some of these administrative activities for you. So what the service will do for you is that it has the ability to automatically spin up the underlying servers, the infrastructure for you. It will automatically install the database engine also for you. The only thing that you need to start doing is start using the database. So this service is good for those companies who want to start quickly using databases without the overhead of going through the headache of installing and configuring the database environment. Now currently at the time of recording this video, these are the databases which are supported by the relation database service. So you have MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, uh, and then there is a database which has been built by Amazon themselves. That's known as AWS Aurora. We will have a separate chapter on AWS Aurora itself. So some of the key advantages of using this relational database service. So I said the first thing is that you don't have the headache of installing everything. When you actually use the wizard to create a database instance using this service, you just have to mention what is the type of storage you want how much storage you want, what should be the underlying capacity of the server. So this is all in your control. Some other important features when it comes to this relational database service, it has this option of an automated backup. 
So if you were a database administrator for let's say a normal database server, in addition to managing the database itself, you would also need to manage the backup because in case if something happens to the database, you should have the ability to restore your database from a failure. So normally a database administrative activity would be to also ensure that backups are done so that restorations can be done in case of disasters. Now in the case of the RDS service or the relational database service, this automated backup is done automatically for you. So it's a feature which you enable or you can even disable it. It has a retention period of a maximum of 35 days. So you can recover data older than 35 days if you want to restore the database. So this is one of the very important features. So again, if you don't want the burden of managing the backup, this can automatically be done by the automated backup services. Now that you have a good understanding of the relational database service, let's go ahead and at least spin up a database, see how it looks like and see what are the different steps when we actually create a database using the relational database service. Hi and welcome back. Now for those who are database enthusiasts, it's very easy to spin up and work with a database solution in AWS. So earlier on we had seen how you could create your own virtual server on the cloud. If you wanted to host your own database solution, you could create a virtual server, install the database software and start working with it. But on AWS, there are solutions available which can help you get a database up and running in the least time possible. One of the services available is the RDS or the Relational Database Service. Using this service, you can create a database in a matter of minutes. There are also a lot of advantages of using this database service. So just to see how we can work with this, let's go on and create a database. Now there are certain database engines which are supported. We have MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server. We also have Amazon Aurora which is a database engine which is created specifically by Amazon. This is a MySQL or a PostgreSQL compatible database. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to choose Microsoft SQL Server. Based on the engine you choose, you have different editions available. I'll just choose the Express Edition. I'll click on Next. Next, we need to choose what should be the underlying server capacity on which this database engine will be running. So I'll just choose a t2.small. So what this service is going to do in the background, it's going to automatically create that virtual server for you and install Microsoft SQL Server. This sort of activity reduces the burden of the database administrator. They don't need to start spinning up virtual servers installing database software. Everything will be done automatically for you by the service. We then choose the amount of storage. It will give you what will be the estimated monthly cost for the solution. Give a database identifier. Give a username and password. Again, leave all of the remaining settings as they are. So if you are familiar with Microsoft SQL Server, these settings will be familiar for you. There is also a backup. So automatically the service can take a backup of your data. Again, such a useful feature of this service. There's no need now 
or the additional burden of the database administrator to configure backups. Automatically the backup will be taken for you. There is a particular retention period and then you can restore your data based on these backups. You also have automatic monitoring for your solutions. So I'm going to go ahead and create the database. If you view the instance details, so now it will currently be in the creating state. Let's come back once the database is created. Once your database is in the available state, you can actually go on and take the endpoint. So here I have SQL Server Management Studio open. I'll put the endpoint in the server name. Enter the login username and password which you used when you created the instance. When you click on connect, you will now be connected to the database in AWS. So now you've seen how easy it was to create or use the RDS service to create a database instance. And now you can connect and work with it as a normal database engine service. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now I want to take this time to explain about a concept known as serverless architecture. So you will hear this a lot in companies wherein they are looking at deploying their applications using serverless architecture. Before we actually dwell into serverless architecture, let me explain a quick concept and then we'll try to understand serverless architecture. Now let's say you want to host an application. Let's say you as an architect, you choose to spin up an EC2 instance and host your application on this EC2 instance. So this is nothing but a virtual server on the cloud. And remember that in the end, this virtual server is actually hosted on a physical server in AWS in one of their data centers. So again, what is the advantage of this is that you don't have to worry about the underlying physical server, the networking, the power supply, the security of this physical server. Everything is taken care by AWS and that is the advantage of having this virtual server in the AWS cloud. But as time has gone on, technology has advanced and now we look towards having serverless architecture where we don't want to even think about having a virtual server or maintaining a virtual server. Just to give you an example, so in an earlier chapter, we had seen a database known as DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is a fully managed, correct? No SQL database. So what is the meaning of fully managed? Remember when we worked with DynamoDB, we started directly by creating a table. We didn't have to install a software. We didn't have to spin up a virtual server, nothing. Everything is taken care by AWS. So here, we don't even have to worry about the virtual server, high availability, fault tolerance, nothing. Everything is taken care by AWS. All you have to do is start, all you have to do is start working with the service. So wouldn't it be great if there was something that could also be used to host your application? Remember, this is for your data. What about your application? Well, as I said, technology is advancing and now cloud platforms even have serverless compute. So by serverless compute, one of the services they provide is AWS Lambda. 
So in AWS Lambda, which we are going to see in subsequent chapters, you can host your code. So you just have to upload your code and you can start running it. You don't need to spin up an EC2 instance. You don't need to install any software, nothing. You just upload your code to a service. The service will automatically run that code in its own container and then you get the results. So you only have to focus on the code itself. You don't need to worry as an architect of using an EC2 instance to host your application. This is known as serverless architecture. When you go as an AWS developer, it is very important to understand how all of these components go together. So I said DynamoDB can be used to host your JSON-based data. AWS Lambda, which we are going to see, can be used to host your code. And we've already seen one more service known as S3, which is the simple storage service, which can be used to store your objects. Here again, you don't need to manage any of the underlying servers. Right, so this was just for you to understand the concept of serverless architecture, which just means that you don't have to worry about not only the physical server, but even the virtual servers, which are used to host your applications. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi, and welcome back. Now in this set of chapters, we are gonna start understanding and working with the DynamoDB service. So now before we actually go on to DynamoDB, let's quickly first talk about traditional SQL databases such as MySQL, Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server. Now the only reason I'm discussing this first is just to make students understand what's the purpose of a NoSQL database because DynamoDB is a NoSQL database. So in these traditional SQL databases, you would have a table, it would have columns, and you would have rows. A very typical table shown over here. Now the tables would have a predefined schema. So this table has three columns, the customer ID, the customer name, and the product ID. And then you have the rows, which have the values for the columns. You could perform complex queries or even joins on other tables. So everybody would be familiar with working with such databases. Now, when it comes to NoSQL, NoSQL databases were introduced as a means to provide faster access to data. So your data would be represented as documents in JSON format. Just giving an example over here. So this is similar to having, let's say, a table with four columns. So you have the first name, the last name, the age, and the address. The only difference is that it's being represented in JavaScript object notation. It's like having a flat file on your system. And then instead of actually querying column by column or row by row, you're querying document by document. Now, why was NoSQL introduced? It's because it allows you to have faster access to your data. So I said it's like accessing your flat file system. So let's say you have a TXT file on your hard disk. You can easily recover the data from it. It would be faster than probably querying a database. Next, this is schemaless in define. And what I mean by schemaless, you don't need to define the schema beforehand. So let's say you had an Oracle database or a SQL database. You would first have to define the table and what would be the columns of the table. But in a NoSQL database, you don't have to define the columns of the table beforehand. We will see this in our demo. So each row in the table can perform or confirm to a different schema altogether. Now in DynamoDB, each document is known as an item and each column is known as an attribute. So each document can have a varying number of attributes. 
Now, if the number of queries is high for simple data, so sometimes if you store this in traditional database systems, they might not scale well, you know, to give you the best response. You might have to do other things such as optimizing your queries, you know, uh, increasing the scalability of your underlying infrastructure. So the, there are a lot of things you probably would need to do in order to ensure that when you have a high number of queries against a high amount of data, then in order to get a better response time, you would need to do that extra bit of work to get the data out. Now, when should you not consider NoSQL is when you have complex queries and table joins. Because this is only meant, NoSQL is only meant if you want faster access to your data in kind of a document or a flat file concept. If you start wanting to have table joins or perform complex queries, then you should not consider NoSQL in your design. Now we come to DynamoDB. Now DynamoDB is a fully managed NoSQL database that's provided by AWS. Here you don't need to set up any servers, install any software, nothing at all. You just start creating the tables and inserting your data. The servers behind the DynamoDB tables are created automatically by AWS and they scale based on demand. So if the number of queries or the number of items being inserted starts increasing, then the servers behind start scaling based on demand. Now this also depends upon something known as a throughput capacity, which we'll be discussing in a later on chapter. But just to make you all understand that the entire infrastructure is still managed by AWS. Now DynamoDB is used by a lot of companies wherein the application queries millions of rows of data. So this is really a popular database that's being used by a lot of organizations. Right, so this is from a good introduction of DynamoDB. Let's now move on to the next chapter in which we're gonna see how to work with tables in DynamoDB. Hi, and welcome back. So now in this lab, we are going to look at working with tables. Now, when you look at tables, DynamoDB also has the concept of tables. Now, even though the underlying data is stored as JSON documents, just to keep it consistent with the naming convention, which people are familiar with normal SQL databases, we still have the concept of tables in DynamoDB. Now, when it comes to the actual rows, in DynamoDB, they are known as items. And when you look at columns, they are known as attributes. So here I'm giving a simple example. Here, if you take one uh, part of the data, the first name and John, this is known as an attribute. So here you have the attribute key, which is the first name, and then you have the attribute value, which is John. Now, this entire section makes up something known as an item. So in a normal table, in a SQL database, you would have this entire thing has a row of data, but in DynamoDB, it's known as an item. Please understand this. This is important from a concept perspective for the future chapters. You can also have multiple items, like multiple rows in a table. When you look at it, how it is represented has a JSON document, just giving an example over here. Now, as I mentioned in the earlier chapter, tables follow a schema list design, wherein each item can have a varying number of attributes. Each table has a partition key. So similarly, like how you have primary keys in a table in a SQL database, you also have the concept of creating something known as a partition key, which also serves as the primary key. Now, this concept of partition key is very important and we are going to discuss this in a later on chapter. Now in a table, which has a partition key, just like the primary key, no two items can have the same partition key value. You can also define something known as a sort key. This along with the partition key becomes something known as a composite primary key. So developers will be familiar with composite primary keys. In DynamoDB, you define that by creating both your partition key and your sort key. 
all items which have the same partition key value will then be sorted based on that sort key value. So let's now go on to the AWS console. Let's create our first DynamoDB table. So here we are in our AWS console. Let's go on to DynamoDB. You can actually see this in the database section. Now currently I have no tables defined in the Singapore area. So let me go ahead and create a table. So you've seen directly you can start creating tables. You don't need to install any database software, define a database, nothing. It's just directly starting with the table. So I'll give a table name. So you have to mention what will be the partition key or the primary key. I said you can also have a composite key which is known as a sort key. Just for the moment to keep things simple, let's first just define the partition key. We need to define what would be the name of the partition key. So let's say I'm defining the customer ID. So you have to define here what is the data type of the underlying data. So it can be string, binary or a number. So I'm going to choose number. Now there are some settings which you can define. We'll go through this in a subsequent chapter. Since we are only focusing on creating tables and items in this particular chapter, let's go ahead with the default settings and click on create. So our table is being created. This will just take a couple of moments, right? It's already done. Now you can go on to items and you can actually start creating items in your table. So let me just minimize this and click on create item. So here you have your customer ID. You can then go on over here and append a string. So I want to add another attribute known as customer name. I'll just put as John, click on save. So we have one item as part of our table. We can go ahead and create another item. I'll make this as two. Again, I'll just put a string of customer mark. And just to show that this is a schema-less design, I will go ahead and actually add another attribute to this item. Right, so now we have our other item added as well. So now you can see the schema-less design. So the first row, has only two attributes and the next row or the next item has three attributes. Here in the console, you can see the data in the table. If you want, you can edit the data at any point in time. If you choose any item, you can go on to actions, you can duplicate it, you can edit or you can delete it. So if you edit, you can change the values now over here, you can see this is in a tree format. If I change this to a text format, you will see the JSON uh, document itself. So this is how the document is stored just to make it easier to enter the values for a person who is not familiar with JSON. It gives you this kind of format where you can actually add attributes to the items in the table. Right, so this marks the end of this lab. So far, we've created a table and added items on to the table. Hi and welcome back. So in this chapter, we are going to go through the AWS Lambda service. So let's take an example to understand what is the benefit of the AWS Lambda service. So let's say you wanted to host a simple .NET c -sharp based application. What would you do? So you would probably create an EC2 instance, drop your code on the EC2 instance, and then ensure the code runs as it should. So you have to provision the EC2 instance. That means you need to pay for it. You need to host your code. You also need to maintain your server as the code is running. You have to apply patches. And then you also need to monitor the server from time to time. So these are just some of the draft list of steps that you need to undertake when you're hosting your own code on your own server in AWS. 
Now what's the benefit of AWS Lambda? Well, this is a fully managed compute service that's provided by AWS. Here, you only have to worry about maintaining your code. The AWS infrastructure will automatically be managed by the Lambda service. So the AWS Lambda service will automatically create the servers in the background and host your code. You just have to deploy and run your code using the AWS Lambda service. The service also automatically scales based on demand. So let's say you have a lot of calls coming in to your application or code in AWS Lambda. The service will automatically scale the background server, so the infrastructure, in order to ensure that it meets the demand of the code which is running on the service platform. It also does automatic security patching, so the underlying servers are automatically patched by the AWS Lambda service. So these are some of the crucial benefits of having or using the AWS Lambda service. When we go into our labs, we'll go through some demos, we'll see how the AWS Lambda service works. And then based on this, you will get a better understanding on what the AWS Lambda service is all about. Now currently, these are the languages which are supported by AWS Lambda. So please make a note. You have Node.js, Java, C Sharp, Go and Python. So if you have other programming languages, this currently can't be hosted on the AWS Lambda service. But then AWS always tries to ensure that it brings in new language platforms to be compatible with AWS Lambda. So keep a lookout on the AWS Lambda documentation page for changes and new languages being added. At the time of recording this video, these are the languages which are currently supported. Now, some of the use cases in which AWS Lambda is normally used. So it's good for running admin level scripts in the background or responding to events or even integration with another service in AWS known as the API Gateway Service. So now that we have an idea of what AWS Lambda is, in the next video, we'll actually see a quick demo on AWS Lambda. So here we are in the AWS console. Now, if you go on to compute, you can go on to the AWS Lambda service. Now, I only have a couple of functions in place. I'll just go ahead and create a new function. I'm going to create this function from scratch. So let's name it as demo function. Here you can choose your underlying programming language. I'm going to leave it as node.js. Now you have to choose something known as an IAM role. A role basically will give this service permissions to write logs to another service known as CloudWatch. Now normally IAM, that's identity and access management roles, is used when you want one service to access another service. This is one use case of IAM roles. This is a more secure way for communication between services in AWS Lambda. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new role from a template. I'll give a role name. Once I've given the role name, I'll go ahead and create my function. Now, once you've gone ahead and created the function, for node.js, you're actually going to get an inline editor in which you can add your code. So I'm going to write some simple code to write something to the log. I'm going to go ahead and save the code. And now we can test the code. We just have to create something known as a test event. I'm going to use a template and define just a sample test event. I'll click on create and I'll go ahead and test my function and now on top you will see that the function has succeeded so it's executed and then you can see the log of hello world. 
you will see the amount of time for which you have been billed. So looking at the service, you can see that in order to execute code, you don't need to spin up a virtual server on the cloud, install anything. Everything is done by you by the AWS Lambda service. And the brilliant thing is that you only get billed for the amount of time the function runs. You don't get billed for storing the function. You only get billed for the duration of the function execution. So this is a very good and cost effective way if you want to host functions in AWS. So this was a quick demo on AWS Lambda. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and a warm welcome back. Now in line with the number of services available in AWS, they also have some cool automation services in place. So I'm going to discuss in the next few chapters, a couple of them. So first is the Elastic Beanstalk service. This service can be used to quickly provision environments. It's good when you want your developers to get up and running with their application on an environment in AWS. It will automatically provision the underlying environment for you in an easy manner. You also have the Opsworks service, which is used for building application stacks. It's compatible with configuration management tools such as Chef and Puppet. And finally, we have the CloudFormation service, which is the infrastructure as a code service. So I'm going to be giving you a quick look at the services. Remember, I'm just trying to give you an idea what the cloud is about, what you can do in AWS. So when you're looking at the demos, it should give you an idea of what each service can do. So let's move on to our first service in this automation stack. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to look at the Elastic Beanstalk service. Now the Elastic Beanstalk service helps you to provision environments in a faster manner. So this is good when you want your development teams to get up and running in developing the application and running it. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say you want to provision a web environment on the AWS cloud. Now, from whatever we've learned so far, especially in the infrastructure design section, what would be the general list of steps? So normally you might build your own VPC and your subnets. You might build an EC2 instance, install the web server, and then host your application. So there is a list of steps that are required for you to get up and running. Now, not only being a list of steps, for a developer itself, if you want them to start working on the AWS cloud, and if you're giving them the responsibility, especially in the DevOps world, you want them to actually get up and running, to have them create these environments might get a little bit complicated because for them, it would be a learning curve to understand how to build a VPC, how to build a subnet, how to build the EC2 instance, because their main role would probably be only development. They would be happy developing applications, but not building environments to host the applications. And I said, sometimes in the DevOps world, you want that correlation. And sometimes for companies, they want the developers to quickly get up and running on develop environments without the need of the operations team providing that environment to them. And now suppose if you want to deploy your web environment to let's say a staging environment, you might want to assign an elastic IP to the instance. You might want to place it behind an elastic load balancer, right? So I said a lot of steps to get up and running for an application. The elastic Beanstalk service can be used to do everything for you automatically. So in the service, you just mention the type of environment you want and the service, the Elastic Beanstalk service will do the rest for you. 
So in the background, if you say that you want a web environment, it will spin up the EC2 instance for you. It will install the web server. It will actually place it as part of an auto scaling group. So it's even looking at scalability of your application. It will place it behind an elastic load balancer. You will also get a fully qualified DNS name which gets registered automatically in Route 53. So all of this is done for you and this allows the developer to only worry about managing the code and not the complete environment. You have different platforms available. So remember when you choose an environment to create, you have to tell the Elastic Beanstalk service what do you require. There are some default environments which you can spin up. So these include PHP, Python, Java with Tomcat or Windows with Internet Information Services. You can also create Docker container environments. You can also create your own custom environments using the Elastic Beanstalk service. So now let's look at a demo so that you can better understand what the Elastic Beanstalk service can do. So here we are in the AWS console. Under Compute, you have the Elastic Beanstalk service. So the first thing we have to do is that we have to create an application. So let's say you want to host an application on Elastic Beanstalk. We just want to give a name for the application and that would actually be a you know, underlying envelope, a container for the application in the Elastic Beanstalk service. So I'm going to click on create application, give an application name and say create. Now, once your application is in place, you can create multiple environments. Now, for example, you could create a separate development environment, staging environment, and even a production environment all under this application. This is how flexible the Elastic Beanstalk service is. So let's go ahead and create an environment. Let's see what goes into creation of such an environment in the service. So you can choose between a web server or a work environment. So let's choose web server. Here you give an environment name. So let me give it as staging. Now, if you want, you can actually put a domain name or you can let it be generated by the service itself. Now you have this pre-configured platforms. So I said that these are all the platforms which are already available with AWS. So if you wanted to basically have, let's say a Tomcat environment, you can choose that. You can either upload your application code or you could choose the sample application. For now, since I just want to show you what goes or what happens when you create an environment in the Elastic Beanstalk service, I'm going to choose the sample application and click on create environment. Now next you will see a series of events and this is basically the service creating the environment for you in the background. This will probably take around several minutes but what you can see is all the details about what the service is doing in the background for you. So as we are actually going along you can see that the service has automatically created an elastic IP for you. It's waiting for an EC2 instance to launch. So here you can see all the events that are taking place. You can also see that there is also a URL which is already in place. So let's come back once the entire environment is created in the service. Now after the environment creation is complete, you will actually get this dashboard. Here you can see the health of the application. You can see the configuration. And there's a lot that you can actually do with this environment itself. You have the configuration itself in which you can control what is the underlying instance type for your instances. You can control whether you want a load balancer and what are the type of updates, deployment, monitoring, etc. 
when you go for the DevOps exam, using the Elastic Beanstalk service is very, very important. And that is where you have to go into further detail. You can also look at logs. You can also look at monitoring of the entire instance of the entire environment. Since we've not done anything on this environment as of yet, it just spun up. That's why there is no data. If you go back to the dashboard, let's take the URL. And when you open it in another tab, you can see the sample application. So you've seen how easy it was to spin up a sample environment which has Java 8 running along with Tomcat. You can then upload your Java based applications automatically. So you can choose your Java application, deploy it. I said you can also create multiple environments. So if you go back to app, right? So this is your staging environment. If you want, you can actually go ahead and create another environment, like a production environment. And another brilliant feature of the Elastic Beanstalk service is the swap environment URLs. In case, let's say you had your staging version, your environment, and you had a production one. You can actually do a swap of the environments. This is good when you have blue green deployments. So let's say you had another environment which had to go into production. You've tested it. Everything is fine. You can actually do a swap so that your new production points to your new environment. That is the brilliant feature of the swap environment URLs feature. So I said, I'm not going into details on the Elastic Beanstalk service because there is a lot. As a solution architect associate, it is important to understand what you can do with the Elastic Beanstalk service. So for now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to talk about the OpsWork service. So this is a configuration management service that's provided by AWS. Now let's say you want to provision resources based on a certain configuration, you can use the OpsWork service. So normally what companies do is that they define stacks. So let's say you want to create a stack of resources in the stack. Let's say you want to have a web server. That web server should be of Red Hat Linux and should have Apache 2 installed. And maybe you want to have an application and a database server also part of the stack also having Red Hat Linux installed. Again, another example in terms of a pictorial representation. So normally companies do define stacks for different environments. So for example, they could have one stack for development, which says that it will consist of a web and an application server. And this will have Red Hat version 2.1 update 6 already installed. And you could also have, I said, Apache 2 installed on the web server. So when a project team wants to start working on an application in the development environment, the IT admin will create a stack which consists of these servers. So a web server and an application server with this configuration. So this will be defined by the IT management that's saying that the development stack should consist of this configuration. So if any team asks for a environment in development, they would get this. Similarly, you could define another stack for production. Again, it would have the same web server and application server but it might have a different version of the underlying operating system. This could be because this might be a stable version of the OS and hence that would be part of the production stack. So when the team wants to get a stack for their production environment, then they would get this. Now, obviously I will not go into the details as to how you would migrate applications from a development to a production stack. I am just giving you an example of how stacks can get defined in companies. Now, normally 
companies use configuration management tools to help configure the environments automatically. So such tools are Chef and Puppet. These are the most popular configuration management tools. Using these tools, you can automatically configure servers with a particular configuration. So let's say you want to have some libraries already installed, you want to have an application already installed, you can use the Chef and the Puppet software. So I said you can use these tools to automatically confirm or ensure that servers are of a particular configuration. Now OpsWork AWS has inbuilt support for Chef and Puppet. So you could reuse your recipes. Now in Chef, you create something known as recipes. So recipe is nothing but code which says this should be the configuration of my server. Well, you can reuse the same configuration or recipes in the OpsWork service. Now, when you go as a DevOps engineer, understanding OpsWork in detail is very, very important. From an associate level perspective, it's important just to understand what's the benefit of having the OpsWork service. So now let's go to the AWS console. Let's have a quick demo of the AWS OpsWork service. So if you go on to the AWS dashboard, let's search for OpsWork. You've got it. Now I've already defined or created something known as stacks. In OpsWorks, we have the same concepts of stacks. So these are stacks of resources. Let's go ahead and create or add a new stack of our own. Now you could create a sample stack or you could create a stack based on Chef 12 or Chef 11 recipes. So I said that has an associate, it's good enough to understand what's the benefit of the OpsWork service. As you go into a DevOps engineer role, then you have to understand all of these stacks in much further detail. Now when you create a sample stack, you can choose your underlying OS, it could be Linux or Windows, and this will automatically deploy a Node.js app onto that stack. So I'm gonna go ahead and create the stack. So this is automatically creating everything for me in the background. It's automatically creating the necessary chef recipes to ensure that Node.js gets deployed as an app on my stack. Once a stack is in place, you can go ahead and explore the sample stack. So in your stack on the left hand side, first is your stack dashboard, then you have your layers. So in your layers, you can have multiple layers. So I said you could have one for the app server, you could create another layer for your web server, you could create another layer for your database server. And each server, you have control over the recipes. So I said these are the chef recipes which get run in order to ensure that the server or the stack confirms to a particular configuration. You also have access to the network layer, to the EBS volumes, etc. If you go on to the instances, so this is an instance which has been created for you and added as part of the stack. I'm gonna go ahead and click on start. So by default, it will be in the stop status. You can then have or deploy your apps. So automatically there is a node.js sample app that is deployed as part of the stack. Now let's come back once the instance is in the running state. Now once the instance is online and has a public IP, if you take the public IP and go to another tab, we will see the home page for the node.js app that automatically gets deployed on our OpsWork stack. So this marks the end of this chapter in which we have seen the basics of the AWS OpsWork service. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we are going to look at AWS CloudFormation. Now this is a service which is used to work with infrastructure as code. And what do I mean by that? So let's take a use case scenario. Let's say you want to deploy a VPC with subnets and you want to deploy an EC2 instance in a particular subnet in that VPC. Now we've already seen how to do that in an earlier section. We went to the AWS console, we went to the VPC dashboard, 
you went to the EC2 dashboard, all of that we've done prior. But all of this has been done manually, right? We've actually gone and provisioned all of these resources. With CloudFormation, you can define a template, JSON code, which can automatically provision everything for you. So you don't have to manually go and deploy a VPC, deploy a subnet, deploy an EC2 instance. You define code, JSON code or YAML based code. You submit it to the CloudFormation service. The CloudFormation service in AWS will automatically provision the resources based on that code. I'm going to give you a very simple code snippet. What this code does is that if you submit this JSON code to CloudFormation, what it will do is that it will provision an EC2 instance with this particular image ID. Now, when you create an EC2 instance, the only property which is required is the image ID. Now, you can also mention that where do you want to deploy this EC2 instance, in which VPC, in which subnet, you can deploy, you can define all of those properties. Now cloud formation templates can become quite large because you are defining the different parts that you want to deploy using the service. I said, for example, I am just deploying a simple EC2 instance, which has only one mandatory property, which is the image ID. Now there are different sections in a cloud formation template. The most important and required section is the resources section. In this section, you define those resources which you need to launch using cloud formation. There are then different types. For example, since we want to deploy an EC2 instance, we are using this type over here. If you want to define or create an elastic load balancer, you will need to define the type of that load balancer. And then you define the properties of the load balancer. Now for each type of resource, you can go to the AWS documentation. You can see those properties which are required or mandatory to specify as part of the cloud formation template. The other properties which are not required will be taken by default. So let's go ahead to the AWS cloud formation. I want to show you how the service works for you to get a better idea. Hi and welcome to this demo in which we are going to look at how the cloud formation service works. Now for the purpose of this demo, I have just switched regions and gone to the Oregon region. Let me go on to cloud formation. Now the first thing that you have to do in cloud formation is to design something known as your template. So I said the template contains the necessary code that's required to deploy your resources. So let's go ahead to design template. Now next you get a template editor in which you can drag and drop resources. But normally people prefer entering the template has either a JSON script or YAML code. So let's go on to template. So I'm going to copy paste this template, which will be used to spin up an easy to instance in the Oregon region. Now, please note that this AMI ID is specific to a type of instance that's available in the Oregon region. So if you switch regions and you try to execute or run this template, it will not run. You will actually encounter errors. So let's go ahead. You can actually validate the template as well. It will make sure that the syntax of the template is correct. We we'll then go ahead and create a stack. So I said it will now create a stack of the underlying resources. Currently, I'm only adding one resource, which is an EC2 instance. I'll click on next. We can give a stack name. You can enter tags, permissions, etc. Since I'm keeping the stack creation simple, I'll go on to next. And then finally, I'll go ahead and create the stack of resources. Now, if you don't see the stack creation over here, you can click on refresh. And now you can see that your stack demo, the status is create in progress. Now, after some time, 
you will see that the status of the stack is create underscore complete. If you click on the stack, you will see the details of the stack. You will see the events which have resulted as part of the deployment of the stack resources. You can also see the template which you have used to deploy the stack of resources. Now I'm going to go ahead and open AWS in another tab. Now we are in still in the Oregon region. Let's go on to EC2. Let's go on to the running instance. And now you'll see that you have one running instance and this is the instance which was created by the CloudFormation stack. So here you've seen how you use code submitted to the CloudFormation service and the CloudFormation service based on your code has deployed resources. This is the advantage of using the CloudFormation service. Now here you have the stack in place, right? If you go to actions and you delete the stack. So I'm going to delete the stack, but keep this note. It's saying it will also delete all of the stack resources. So when you delete a stack, it will start deleting the resources that it created. So now if I click on refresh for the EC2 dashboard, you will see now that it is in the shutting down state and after some time it will be in the terminated state. So this is how the cloud formation stacks work. For now this marks the end of this demo. Hi and welcome back. Now I thought in this chapter I'll just quickly go through the architecture of my own site. So this is just a collaboration site which I share with my students. So on this collaboration site, I put on different articles which correlate to the courses which I publish on the Udemy platform. So this is the architecture. It's not that complicated. I have one EC2 instance. On this, I have installed a software known as Atlassian Confluence. So I have actually paid for the license and I have actually installed this product on this EC2 instance. I am then connecting my EC2 instance to a MySQL relational database instance. So I'm using the AWS relational database service. I've spun up a MySQL instance and I am actually connecting my Atlassian Confluence uh, system to the MySQL database. Now, in order to ensure that, you know, it's a seamless user experience for users across the world, because I have students on the Udemy platform from around 150 countries. So I want to ensure that if any of these students want to visit my collaboration site, that they get the best user experience possible. And hence, I have actually placed my EC2 instance as the origin behind an Amazon CloudFront web distribution. So this Amazon CloudFront will take the content from my collaboration site and then give it out via the different edge locations located around the world and deliver to the users which are closest to the edge location. I am then using Amazon Route 53. I have defined my DNS domain name. So actually I have purchased a domain name via another provider known as GoDaddy. And I have actually just ensured that there's a link between Amazon Route 53 and GoDaddy for my domain name. So when users actually go to the URL commitmenthub.com, they will actually go on to Route 53. Route 53 in turn will direct the request to Amazon CloudFront and then Amazon CloudFront will first check if the content is present in its edge location. If yes, it will deliver to the user. If not, it will go back to my EC2 instance. It will collect the content and then send it across to the user. So now what's my spending like? I just want to share this across with you. So currently I'm using a Windows T2.medium instance. Now I'm actually more familiar with the working of Atlassian products on the Windows uh, site. So that's why I've chosen a Windows system. Uh, I'm using a T2.medium, which is a two CPU and four GB RAM. Now I'm currently spending around 40 USD for this instance per month. Now remember all of these figures is on a monthly basis. Now, when it comes to the underlying EBS volume, so you also get charged for the amount of storage you are allocating to the instance. 
So I currently have allocated 50 GB. Now I am getting an additional around 14 USD per month. Now this is a, anyway. Now this entire setup is uh, currently as part of my free tier account. So as part of the free tier account, you get 30 GB, which is free. So I'm spending that additional 14 USD for the additional 20 GB. For my RDS instance, I'm using a T2 dot medium and I'm spending 85 USD. Now you could reduce the cost if you are probably hosting your own instance. So if you had your own T2 dot medium, you could host your own MySQL database. And I'm actually going to try that out in a couple of months just to get my collaboration site up and running. I just use the service which is available in AWS. I want to see what's the difference between using that service, not only from a cost perspective, but also from a maintenance perspective over having my own EC2 instance with MySQL installed. For CloudFront, currently I don't have any charge because as part of the free account, you get 50 GB of transfer out free and 2 million requests. So currently I really don't have 2 million requests on my website, but in case if that time does come, then obviously I will get charged accordingly. So here I am in the AWS console. So I have one t medium instance, which is running. So this is hosting my Atlassian Confluence uh, software. I have defined this in my own VPC. So I've created my own custom VPC, my own subnets. So I said, when you actually go to an associate level certification, you will have to learn this in more detail. And that time you'll be more comfortable in creating VPCs and subnets. Uh, then if I go on to my relational database section, so I have a MySQL instance. This is running on a db2.t2.medium. Then I have Amazon CloudFront. So this is my distribution, which I've created. I then have an origin for the CloudFront distribution, which is pointing to the DNS name for my EC2 instance. And then I have raw 53. So I have my hosted zone. So commitmenthub.com. And in that I have created an alias record. So an alias record can be used to point to certain resources, which you can define in AWS. So you can have your targets to elastic load balancers, to CloudFront distributions, to buckets in S3, which are behaving as static websites. So currently I am actually pointing this out to my CloudFront distribution. So if I go on to my site, so this is a site which I've just launched recently using the Atlassian Confluence software. So I'm continuously adding content to the site. Earlier I was working off a WordPress site, but then I thought let's try something new. So I went to using a collaboration software that's Atlassian Confluence, and I'm actually adding documentation for both the AWS platform and Microsoft Azure, and hopefully in the future, even for the Google Cloud platform. So I just want to show you what you could do with AWS platform. It's very flexible. You can host your own software and distribute to users across the world. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi, and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I quickly just want to discuss a little bit about costing. Now costing is obviously very important for any company, for any individual. So as I mentioned before, one of the best things about cloud computing platforms is you don't need to pay anything upfront. You pay everything based on a monthly charge based on your usage. Now, one of the cool things about cloud computing platforms is they have a, you know, a mechanism which can help you determine what could be your forecast charges for the services you are using. For example, in AWS, they have something known as a calculator. So the calculator can actually give you a good indication of what would be the cost if you're going to use a particular service. For example, over here in the calculator on the left hand side, you have the different services available in AWS. So let's say you wanted to create or host an Amazon EC2 instance, so a virtual server on the cloud. First of all, you have to choose your region because remember the price differs on a region basis. Next, you can add a new row. 
So here you can say what is the description of the instance. So let's say you want to host a web server. How many instances do you want? So I'll say one. You can give what would be the estimated utilization for your instance. I'm going to add it as 50%. And then you choose what would be the instance type. So you could go on to settings and choose an instance type. Then choose what should be the operating system. So remember it also differs on this. I'll click on close and save. And now you can automatically see there's an estimate arriving or coming for your monthly bill. So as you keep on adding more and more items in this cost calculator, the estimation for your monthly bill will come on this tab. So this gives you a good indication of how much you are going to spend. So this is good also when you want to create a business case for hosting a solution on AWS. So let's say you work for an organization has an architect and you want to give a business case on what would be the cost benefit of hosting a solution on an AWS cloud computing platform. One of the good way of getting what would be the costing for the solution can come from this calculator. Also, when you're using AWS, when you have your own account, there is a separate section known as your billing dashboard. And this billing dashboard can again give you a lot of useful insight into how much you are spending. So when you are using the free tier account, it will show you the usage limit and it will also show you your month to date, how much you are using. So this gives you a good indication in case you are going to go beyond how much you are using in the free tier account. Now, because I use this account for a lot of demos and a lot of trainings, obviously I don't mind going beyond the free tier usage. You can also look at the bill details. So if you go on to the bill details, you can actually see the billing details per service being used. And per service, you can also see a breakdown region wise. So this gives you a very good indication of how you are using your services based on the costing. One of the other good things from the dashboard itself that in addition to telling you what you spent last month and what is your current expenditure to date, it will also show you a forecast. And normally the forecast is pretty accurate. So this will let you know that at the end of the month, how much costing or how much you're gonna spend on AWS. So when you're working with AWS, let's say you're testing, let's say you're trying to explore how it works, I always recommend going to your cost explorer to see how you are doing when it comes to your budget and your costs. For now, this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I just want to talk about some misconceptions or just some facts about cloud computing. So the first thing I want to talk about or I want to say from my opinion that a lot of people think that cloud computing is only for developers. So when you go into different courses available for cloud computing, when you go for certification courses, you will always see that there are different certifications, different parts, different roles available on the certification courses for cloud computing. And that clearly shows that cloud computing is not only meant for the development community. Yes, it has a lot of features that you can integrate to development, but then cloud computing is also meant for different roles. So if you are a system admin, if you're working with data, if you're a network administrator, or even if you're just a consultant for a company, there are many roles which suit when it comes to cloud computing. So when you go on to different courses, when you go on to different certification parts, please try to understand this. So I've seen a lot of students 
for some courses, not only mine, but even others or even certification parts, they think why is not focus given on development? I said each path in cloud computing is different and there are different domain areas which people can explore. So please keep this in mind. Next, cloud computing is easy to use, yes. It's cost effective, yes. Everyone should learn about it, a complete yes. But I just want to bring our two points. Even though it's easy to use and cost effective, please do monitor what you are using, how much you are using. So I've seen people in various forums complaining that the costs are going high for their AWS account. Now I've been using AWS accounts for the last three to four years and I have not seen any reason as to why the cost which I am using is not justified. So if I've been using a resource, it's coming up as a cost and I agree to it. There are very few situations in which if you feel that you are being wrongly charged for something, then you can actually go back to AWS support. But more often than not, if you do not understand what you are using, if you don't monitor how much you are using, then you could be surprised at the end for the costs that you incur. So again, it's your responsibility to monitor not only how much you are using but also the costs. I've already shown you this in an earlier chapter where you can actually monitor the cost for your AWS account. And then finally is the requirement. Yes, everyone should learn about the cloud and AWS. The future is the cloud. But then you have to look at the requirements. Sometimes what you need to architect as a solution, what you need to develop, doesn't necessarily have to be on the cloud. It depends on what you are building, what you are building it for, what is your user community. So the design practices, your requirements practices all stay the same. It's only if you have the proper use case scenario and business case to jump onto the cloud, then you should. There are many companies who have a hybrid approach wherein they have part of the solutions on their on-premise environment and part of the solutions on the cloud. That also works. So keep this in mind. I said monitor what you are using. Secondly, ensure that you have the right requirements for using the cloud. So again, just a few points I want to bring about all based on my experience. Now this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now that this course is come to a completion, right? We've gone through some basic services. We've looked at the virtual private cloud. We've looked at spinning up a virtual server on Amazon. And we've looked at the simple storage service. So now what's your next part? What should you do next? Well, Amazon Web Services has a list of certifications which is very very popular among IT professionals. If you look at a majority of IT professionals in the world today, they normally all go for certifications on the Amazon Web Services cloud platform. Now doing a certification course not only helps you learn more about Amazon Web Services, but you also get a certificate in hand to prove that knowledge. So I'm going to go through in the next chapter, what are the list of certifications in Amazon Web Services. This will give you a better idea on the path you want to choose in cloud computing. Hi and welcome back. Now I'm here to talk about certifications. Now the AWS certifications, I said is one of the most popular certifications when it comes to the IT industry. So here I have a web page from Forbes. So this shows you the 15 top paying IT certifications. And you can see that in this list, you have two certifications from Amazon Web Services. 
So first is the AWS Certified Solution Architect and Associate. And you can see the expected annual salary based on their scales, based on their surveys. And this by far, I'm telling you, is one of the most popular certifications. On Udemy itself, you will see a lot of courses available for the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate. And you also have the AWS Certified Developer Associate. So when you go on your certification path, now I've been doing Amazon Web Services certification for the last three years. I have also certified myself on the Microsoft Azure platform. So when it comes to cloud platforms, I have certifications on multiple cloud platforms. Now for those students who are preparing their journey on the AWS cloud in certifications, there is a AWS certified cloud practitioner certification. This is the foundation level. This is a beginner. I normally suggest students to take this certification if you're beginning your journey on a cloud platform, if you're beginning your journey on Amazon Web Services. I know a lot of students like to directly take the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate because I said that's one of the most popular certifications, but it's difficult. It's not easy. It takes time. And if you're new to cloud computing, it will be very difficult for you to actually understand the concepts. And I normally prefer or I normally advise students to first go for the certified cloud practitioner and then go on to the next level. So on the next level, when you look at the associate level exams, so after the foundation exam, you have the associate level exams. So in the associate level, you can take the solutions architect. So this is the architect level exam. Then you have the developer. So for those development communities who like to go and develop solutions on AWS, and then you also have one which is separate for IT administrators. And once you finish the associate level, you can then take the professional level, which is much more difficult than the associate level certifications. You need to have a lot of hands-on experience to pass the professional.